Thank you very much, uh, Mary, and it's great that we had Mary to put it into the historical context. And uh, it, it's like a family reunion, a school reunion, I should say, really. School. Well, family in the sister's way, and then a school reunion bringing all these battered veterans together again. Uh, many of us in happy retirement, uh, and with all the scars to, to, to show it, and a lot of pride. And I want to congratulate uh, Mary McAuliffe and uh, everybody who has helped to work organising this group today because I have a strong sense of another wave which I think is global and it now can afford to be global because in fact of the whole technology, of the whole sense of being able to stay in touch with one hour, of instant uh, intelligence and instant research being available uh, and I'm very excited by that and I think that the recent election and the uh, prominence of, of women uh, they may not have made it to the, to the White House in their own right, but the whole debate that was uh, in the recent American election, plus the extraordinary, extraordinary election of an amazing visionary man uh, breaking down so many of the barriers that we, in our turn, had attempted to, to break down in decades ahead, is a, is a vision of hope. And I, I think we all join. But there was, I mean... Uh, and I'll be making a, a short reference because unfortunately, naturally, because all our wonderful speakers, we will be making short references. But one of the per people I want to make a good reference to with regard to uh, her total interest and support here was Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I will be talking later in, kind of in, in sequence order about where, how and where she entered and what she did for us. And uh, I, my sadness is that that actually wasn't highlighted enough uh, during the bombardment during her campaign. But look, women always learn from recent history. And I think that all of us have got a lesson in how women are treated in the recent elections as well. There was a lot of hope, there was a lot of uh, uh, to be celebrated in the election results, but there was also a lot to be learned with regard to how women were treated. And I think we do need to take that seriously. From Hillary Clinton and, and the way she uh, had the, the terrible negative, to even the terrible, terrible attacks of cruel, cruel attacks on Sarah Palin, who was, in fact, the, you know, taken as the token woman, and my God, all of us in our history know how token women are dragged in always in order to stop the strong women. And it, 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 so I think that as students, you might do a few theses on that uh, uh, because it's, it's still so lively and it is still so relevant to us. Uh, but it, it also raised a huge amount of woman power, of, of women uh, commenting uh, in the United States and having powerful roles as interviewers and as columnists, Maureen Dowd and people like that, extraordinary, uh, and making more sense than most of the other columnists. So there's a lot to be celebrated and there's a lot to be taken seriously about women now. And above everything else, I think women have the capacity to get up, rub themselves down and start all over again. And I think this is part of what we're doing here today. Because I think that younger women, uh, uh, when, they, when, uh, when I talk now, uh, younger women, and give the sequence, of some of which Mary has already told you about, younger women today think, oh my God, I didn't know about that. I thought it was because we were members of the European community. I thought it was because of the United Nations. They don't realise the actual, n not just legislative uh, uh, the acts that had to be taken and my god I'm so proud to be part of the women here who as ministers brought that about uh, but also they, they consciousness raising to make it acceptable because I mean when we started we were either well healed women uh, in the famous context we were asking for, for equal pay or uh, you know uh, we, we didn't know our place or we were taking the jobs of men, or we were neglecting our children, uh, or we were giving a status to single mothers that they didn't deserve because the Constitution said they could only be recognised if they were married. And, in fact, we have a piece of legislation coming in at the moment, uh, and, and Kathleen will be involved in that, that's actually starting that, that debate again. Now... I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of, of in fact, that it didn't happen by itself. And uh, again, like Mary, I want to pay huge 
uh, gratitude to the women who in the dark days of, nine, of the 60s, when most of us were confined at home, bringing up children and told that was our only role in life, and um, we had these wonderful women, like Blanche Weeks, Dr Blanche Weeks, Business and Professional Women Trinity, uh, we had of course the wonderful Hilda Tweedy, and we had the Widows Association, we had Kathleen Delap, and all that wonderful Irish Country Women's Association, a powerful, quiet, backy organisation. They all came together and they lobbied, and had to lobby very hard, as Mary said, to get the Commission for the Status of Women set up under the wonderful chairmanship of Tech Libier, Dr. Tech Libier, the woman who had re reached the highest level in the public service and was extraordinary as Secretary of the Department. In fact, I think it was only in the last few years that some other yes. woman reached yes. that level of being Secretary of a Department, and she was extraordinary. And I must tell you, a wonderful story in that regard. When we set up the Women's Rights Committee, uh, which is a powerful Oireachtas committee, uh, after uh, Labour and uh, Fine Gael came in, 83 onwards, and we had this wave of women as well, we had 40 women in, and um, uh, the, there, was, there was much uh, juggling around for uh, chairs, as there still is, you'll tell you. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the, part of the negotiation was that the opposition, which Fianna Fáil was in then, would have to have the chair of the Women's Rights Committee. And Charles Hawhey decided that he would like to be the chair of the Women's Rights Committee. And I got word of this on the grapevine, and I actually, first of all, I tried politically, and then publicly, I said that we, the whole of Fine Gael, of that grouping, would pull out. We would not participate in that committee if a man was chairing it because of the importance of a role model. that Of all the, of all the Baroctus committees, you had to have a woman sharing it. So he conceded, as long as it was a Fianna Fáil woman, and a wonderful Fianna Fáil woman, Maura Gagan Quinn, who can go down in history, is one of the strongest women, brought some of the best legislation in when she was Minister for Justice. But some time later, I was going up in the lift with Charles Howey, and he said to me... Uh, by the way, uh, what is a role model? <laughs> so I explained that how terribly important it was to have. <clears throat> so he thought for a moment and then he smiled and he said, Ooh, so I made a role model when I put Tech Le Beer in charge of the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it extraordinary that it's still reflect us back on him? But anyway, I just think that's a lovely, a lovely anecdote. And that, that five-year committee was extraordinary. We concentrated, one of the first areas we concentrated was about education, but the second one, and by God, I'm coming back to it today, now you tell me when, I'm, when I have to shut up, because um, <clears throat> I'm trying to get so much across. Um, one, one of the areas that we concentrated on first was women in advertising because of the total exploitation there was of women then, of being sold with tractors and cars and everything else, and unfortunately, it's done, talk about a reversal of fortune for us there. It was a wonderful, we, we through the uh, Association of Advertising Standards, they cooperated totally with us, and they brought in uh, standards and regulations that would not allow women to be uh, abused and exploited like that again. <coughs> And we, one of the things we did was we had the editors of the various magazines and daily newspapers in. And in, in one wonderful moment, we actually appended the letter to the report that committee did on women in advertising. Uh, because the then editor of the Sunday World came in and objected totally to us, these people spoiling. And I mean, at this stage, at least 50%, if not more, of our committee were men. And that was very important. But he said that um, he totally rejected this, there was nothing wrong with it, that you really couldn't or wouldn't be attracted to attract if there was a man with wife on flying out. <laughs> but if you had a woman in a bikini, well, that was different because, this is the, these are the immortal words, because God planned it that way. <laughs> And we were, so, and you know, the people who were most indignant at that, at that, the men, they were absolutely so.
so now, the women were so used to hearing this kind of language used against them anyway. But the, uh, we found that the consciousness raising that was done on that committee for men and by men, which is so important because they actually, out of their own sense of power and privilege, were not used to the kind of level of of insult that women had been absorbing for years. So we got a huge, wonderful male support for every bit of reporting and legislation that we uh, enact, well, managed to get through in that, and it, it rape legislation of the lot. Uh, and Sheila was on it, and Maura Gaten Quinn, as Minister for Justice, brought in probably one of, uh, one of the most dramatic bits of legislation when <clears throat> she had uh, homosexual, male homosexuality decriminalised mm -hmm. and she approached it as a mother, she approached it as a woman and she had not one dissent within the doll. There was a little dissent within the shadow, certainly, but it was extraordinary. And I do think that it was the same with uh, our rape legislation. We managed to bring in a very, very strong uh, <clears throat> that included the whole concept of rape within marriage and of buggery and all the other because before that well you all know because you all debated it but that was through the powerful uh, ministerial positions that women had and that is why it's so important that women are in the political sphere and at that part and i always felt right from the very beginning that we had to get to the center of power where where it is. And I also felt that women had an extraordinary ability, once they did, to be able to make reasonable, based on experience and their own experience, which was excluded from all the legislation before that, once they were there, and that most reasonable, rational men within that concept of family, of their daughters and everything else, were actually brought on board. But unless you have the woman in there to do that, you know, it remains, you know, on the, anyway, those wonderful women managed to, uh, that Mary also talked about, had the Commission Stairs Women set up, and then in, that was, that became public to us in 73, and then the Women's Political Association was set up, first of all by the redoubtable Margaret Waugh, and um, then it became <coughs> part of the Council for Stairs of Women, as did a huge number of other very important women's organisations. And we then got to uh, the local elections where we were raising the profile for women. And some women got through and there was, a, there was a consciousness that we should have more women at local level. We had 1975 Women's a Year, United Nations Women's a Year. We had a huge uh, meeting in the RDS. We had women from the United States, from Nordic countries and everything to speak at it. And it was so exciting. And women travelled from all over the country and were so energised, it was unbelievable. Then, <clears throat> Women's Representative Committee was set up by the late Michael O'Leary, who was Minister for Labour then, mm -hmm. and chaired by the wonderful Eileen Desmond. And that continued until it was replaced by the, um, the whole equal pay legislation that came in in 1976. And then in 1977, we got the Employment Equality Agency and the Equal Opportunities Act to actually make sure, thank you so much, to make sure that it became enforceable. And I want to say this again, we had a very strong Equal Pay Act. And our employment agency with Sylvia Meehan and all those wonderful people but also it involved having both the employers and the um, apart from women representatives as well and the unions and that was so important we then got now all during this time during the 70s we realised that we had to train women and engage them and persuade them to get into politics because it was totally male and totally uh, negative, really, for women. Monica, tell them about the joke. Remember what you said about jokes? Yeah. You said you love being in politics except for the jokes. I've got it many times because you were excluded by the men's jokes. Yes. 
And I think that still, and Kathleen will say that part of our difficulty still is that there is still a very, very male presence in most of the parliaments of the world. Uh, and that, uh, they, that men can feel very inhibited and that we're spoiling their fun, you know, if they want to have a joke session. <coughs> I won't make any more comment on that with regard to that at all. <coughs> anyway, we, uh, in, the, in 79, uh, we, uh, we, first of all, after 74, uh, I got in touch with all the women across party and <coughs> uh, asked them to set up a second tier of the Women's uh, Political Association called Women Elect. These were women who were actually elected. We held meetings all over the country. It was cross-party, independent women. We met everywhere. Women joined in from every party. And we shared. We shared training. We shared confidence building. And by the time the 14 women made the breakthrough in 1981 and 82, because there were three elections, which enabled us to get in, we all knew one another. We had worked with one another outside the actual uh, political scene. So the great strength that the women had then was we were friends and it was above party politics and we networked. All right. Now, <clears throat> what I'm, I, I, I'll end up, because other people, other people can uh, add to this and they will, all I want to say is, you do need to network. That is, that's the biggest message I have. If you do, if we do, we're all powerful. And Orna Mulcahy, in the Times a couple of days ago, wrote about the difficulty women have in networking with one another. <clears throat> because men, as she said, they go into any meeting... And the next thing, the card comes out, the business card comes out. And she said, the woman is rummaging around the bottom of the big bag, <laughs> trying to find a card, and eventually ends up writing the telephone number on a receipt. <laughs> we just are professional about networking. And the other thing that we need to do, and she pointed this out as well, we should look to men for advice and support and breakthroughs because they're used to it. They created it. They made up the original network. And women are, sometimes they feel they can't do that. And secondly, if they do it, women are still suspicious of one another. And I think the third wave, if we're talking about the third wave, must be our opening up to one another, our trusting one another, our knowing that there is a share there that we can all be part of. And that we don't need to deny our little political or uh, professional position that it's not under threat if we help other women. And I'm just going to end, Mary, by saying that somebody said a long time ago, when you climb the ladder, don't pull it up after you. And I think that that's what women have to learn in this wave We've broken through the legislative, we've broken through, but the networking and the support for one another without being uh, embarrassed by it. So, we could go on forever, but we will. 